so important. Please take time to pen down uh, your story, whatever God has done in your life. Right. Okay. Today, as you can see, I'm not the speaker. I'm so relaxed. In fact, today is like, oh, I don't have to preach today. Isn't that wonderful? Somebody's taking my place. <laughs> and none other than we have Stefan before, but before we clap for him, encourage him or whatever, <laughs> thank God for him for, for preaching today. I just want to share and uh, introduce this wonderful man that I've grown to love him and his family, his wife, Abby, and uh, Evan, a cute little Evan, like mascot of our C3 like that. <laughs> uh, this, uh, I've, I've known uh, Stefan, I think, how many years? 13? Would be close to 13 or 14, I'm not sure. Huh? I, I know it's on the first or second year of our church. When we first started our KL church, he came in, huh? a young man. And he was so passionate about worship, actually. That was what attracted him to this church because... He just loved playing, uh, worshipping God, playing his guitar and serving God. And he's started our church doing that and has not stopped ever since. <laughs> and he has been wor as our worship lead, uh, part of our worship team. And now he has uh, become the director, worship ministry director. And uh, he's proven to be a great leader, a respected leader among all the worship leaders and, and musicians. Everybody just loves Stefan. He's... He's got such a good ear for music, huh? And uh, he's a great leader and also pastoring over. Yes. Yeah. Don't be deceived by his outward appearance. He looks like he's very laid back and cool, I tell you. He's a strong leader. He can tell you in a nice way, hopefully. <laughs> no, that's right. no, huh? no, right. I've heard otherwise. I've never seen that part of him, but I've just heard about it from uh, Abby and from different people that he can be very strong and eh? comes out really strong about what he's passionate or what he believes in, which is good. Huh? We need strong leaders, all right, uh, to lead this church. And uh, lately, of course, he's been appointed as our EC as well. In fact, he's the chairman of our executive council. And he's leading, he's got great passion and vision for the future of this church, which we're going to talk more about it, share with you the leadership and the church, what our plans are. Uh, there's so much that we wish we can start telling you already, but we're just you know, going slowly, one step at a time. Uh, but I'm glad to be serving alongside uh, with uh, Stefan. Not only is he a great leader out in the marketplace, but he's a great leader here, faithful, consistent, <laughs> stable. It doesn't matter what happens, whatever happens in, in the church life or outside, he's just demonstrated that calmness, that peace, that confidence. You know, even the last incident, I would say, that happened in our, in our church where we were robbed and he was uh, robbed of his bass guitar. Oh, I tell you, we were all saddened by it, you know. And he, of course, would be affected the most because that's his, his passion is collecting guitar. And loss is one of his good guitar, his bass guitar. But God's so good, he had such a positive attitude towards it and just get on with uh, serving God and not allow anything, any bad incident to affect him. So thank God. We need people, more people like that. Amen? And so today, he comes with not just music background but a real understanding and a knowledge of the word of god you'll be amazed at his knowledge of god's word but more than just knowledge like what abby was saying hmm? it's not what you know but what we do with what we know that's important right and uh, the wisdom that he he handles uh, as a father or as a, uh, a leader out there in the marketplace even in church are really highly <laughs> commendable, huh? highly commend uh, our Stefan here. So will you please help me welcome our bishop. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm making people more nervous. <laughs> our Stefan here today, our Mr. Stefan Ong. Can you put your hands together for... Thanks, Pastor. Okay, so with an introduction like that, even I want to hear my own message. <laughs> okay, but, but I think I need to cool off because I'm getting too big-headed. So let's just uh, have a short time. Let's uh, watch this little music video. It's just a short little thing. Just to set the tone, right? Thanks.
his uh, youngest daughter actually and to think something that could crush a man he could write a song like that so it's a, it's a tremendous thing but you know but today I just want to focus on uh, worship instead of worrying worship or worry very very cryptic worship or worry right okay so let me just set the tone worship or worry why I, I use the word worship or worry is because most of the time uh, I think uh, a lot of us uh, if, if uh, who are Christians who are, who are, uh, or, or those who are not made a commitment yet you probably know that worship is actually an integral part of Christian uh, life uh, because we are worshipping a, a God and we are praising and worshipping a creator who first loved us so much he gave his only son to die on the cross for us so besides word and besides prayer worship is a very very integral part so what is this worship all about okay so let's just take uh, a closer look into worship or worry yeah? Yeah. okay so worship or worry now in Philippians 4 verse 6 okay right let's just take a look I know you've got to exercise that Bible it's, it's important because now I've used iPad so much right sometimes when I take back the Bible right, my good news Bible my old beat up good news Bible when I first got when I was first a uh, young kid I'm like where is Philippians oh yeah after Matthew before Revelation okay that helps okay okay so Philippians 4 6 basically it says do not fret or have any anxiety or worry or stress about anything but in every circumstance and in everything by prayer and petition which is definite request with thanksgiving continue to make your wants known to God and that's worship so the Bible in that verse alone it just basically speaks of two things worship worry you've got anxiety but then you've got worship so the Bible is very very clear in our life right you will have problems okay let's just set the tone how many of you have had problems okay okay I'm gonna give you an illustration how many of you had a day like this you wake up you're all groggy you roll out of bed you slip on the floor you land smack on your face okay then you think man this uh, okay so you pick yourself up wife laughs at you okay no sympathy at all okay you 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 clamber out clamber out right and then you're half groggy you don't have time for breakfast so obviously you're rushing so you go and try and iron your business clothes make sure it's white it's pristine because you got a good meeting to go to you know it's, it's, it's going to be very very important you have to meet the client so you know you've got to look best so you pick up your two-year-old you're heading out the door and then the two-year-old decides to dump Milo on top of your business suit great so you're like oh man okay just can't get any worse you go back you change everything you're late you're running late you go down cars having some engine problems but you decide to ignore it you drop the toddler off at you know at the babysitter you come in you're all flustered everyone knows you're stressed and then you know like when you're late into a meeting right and everyone looks at you you know you feel bad but then when you look extra flustered and stressed you look even worse right you feel even terrible right so you just go in there and everyone's like oh man this guy is obviously late and he's like completely flustered so everyone right has this I'm um, sorry guys, you know, that awkward, I'm sorry guys, I'm late for a meeting, and then everyone's like, mm -hmm. but they look at you, you're all flustered, ah, this guy is not going to contribute anything. So you know, oh man, you know, it, it just can't get any worse, and then it just gets worse, uh, one account you lose during the day, and just when you think things can't go wrong, you burn the stew, stew goes bad, everything, and then at the end of the day, when you tuck yourself in the bed, you just feel like curling up inside your pillows, right, and just say, God, why? Just why? Oh God, it's over, right? It's one of those days. How many of y'all had those days? Non-stop, you know, it's just terrible. It's just terrible, right? Right? And you know what? And in that circumstance, right? In that circumstance, the Bible is very, very clear. It says, you know what? Even in that circumstance, you have to make a choice. You've got to decide. Do you worry or do you worship? Because you, you can't have both. Because the Bible is very clear. If you worry, you can't worship. If you can't worship, you can't worry. Now, being in a, in a worship ministry, right, it's important that you all have to understand what is worship. Now, a lot of people, when you talk about worship, the first thing that comes to your mind is, worship is music. Yeah. The band is playing, and then they're playing relentless. Uh, uh, I love relentless. Yeah. You know, 
that's worship, right? Or worship is music, the band, and the setting in a church. So that's worship to you. But the Bible basically speaks of something very, very interesting because it actually says that in Psalm 105, it says, Seek, inquire of for the Lord and crave Him and His strength, His might and in inflexibility to temptation. Seek and require His face and His presence evermore. In some version, it says, Go to the Lord for help and worship Him continually. Question, if worship was just about music and singing, and the Bible says you are to go to the Lord for help and worship Him continually, how many of us can actually do a marathon, 24-hour singing kind of thing? No, right? One hour is probably a stretch. I know some of you guys are karaoke champions. You know, maybe you're like two hours. Maybe you want to make your, your money's worth. You want to sing three hours. But even then, you, the, these karaoke centers, they'll have this like, like free grub or free food because you're going to get exhausted, right? right? Even your body is going to wear out. So how is it that you can worship God continually? Ever wondered? Because we are actually commanded to worship God continually. So it gives us a, a, a glimpse that actually worship is not about the music. In fact, it may not even be about the place or the setting or singing the songs. The clue is actually in Hebrews 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 to 16. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, it says, through Him, therefore, let us con constantly and at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. Yeah, makes sense. We, we know that. Which is the fruit of our lips that thankfully acknowledges and confesses and glorifies His name. But this is where it gets interesting because in verse 16, it says this, Do not forget or neglect to do kindness and be good, to be generous and distribute and contribute to the needy, of the church as the embodiment and proof of fellowship for such sacrifices are pleasing to God see the sacrifices of praise and then the next verse it talks about you're actually to do good to do kindness this is an acceptable sacrifice unto God in other words worship is not only about your singing it's not about the gathering it is about your living it's a lifestyle it's about you going out there and making a difference that is worship unto God so, so a lot of people have this idea like, oh no man, you know, worship is just for the worship team. You know, I'm not gifted in the area of worship. You know, I can't serve in worship. Just to give you a clue, worship is actually mandatory. Yeah? <laughs> it, it's, a, it, it's something that we actually do on a daily basis. You don't have to be gifted for it. The very fact that you can acknowledge and, and acknowledge your, your, your gratitude to God, that's great. That itself is worship. When you can actually do your nine to five, and you know, show somebody and make a difference out there at your workplace. Sometimes it may be fetching the inconvenience, you know, inconveniencing yourself and giving your colleague a lift. That itself is a worship. It's avoda. It's actually service. It's part of your worship, right? So today, what we're going to do is we're going to see the six aspects of worship. Now, why is this six aspects? Sorry, blah, blah, blah. tongue twister. Six aspects. She sells seashells in the seashore. Okay, the six aspects of worship okay because worship has so many aspects right so many characteristics but what is very very important why i want to just cover briefly is this six aspects of worship actually gives you an idea of what we can do you know to actually worship in the midst of our war zone in the midst of our worrying and anxiety this is six aspects will basically help us through okay so one of the stories that we we're going to basically jump into and highlight is King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. So let's just move to the next point, yeah? Now, some of y'all might know this, King Jehoshaphat. Now, King Jehoshaphat is a very, very interesting king because let me give you a setting. Um, king Jehoshaphat was actually a very, very young king. Uh, the Israel was actually divided now. The two kingdoms actually split. So you don't have actually a unified kingdom already. It was actually due to a, a political thing. It was, there was a political rift. It was split into two kingdoms, the uh, kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And he was actually a young king uh, appointed for, uh, for Judah. And uh, before this, before chapter 20, um, 
a little background was this king, King Jehoshaphat, uh, the Bible talks that he was actually a god that was, uh, I mean, he was a king that was actually very zealous for God. Um, he was very, very loyal. And he basically, uh, basically had a decree and got the whole uh, nation of Judah to basically kickstart a revival program, you know, to go and stop worshipping idols and then get back to him. So, he, so you, you must understand this setting. He's a young king. He's just been appointed. I say young because, you know, he's about 30-something. But I'm, so I'm definitely older. But see, age is all relative, yeah? So he's still young, right? So he's a young king. He just got on the throne. He just had a revival program. He did everything that was good for God, right? Okay? So this is the setting. And what does Second Chronicles chapter 20 start with? In verse 1, After this, which is after the revival program and all the great things he has done, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and with them, the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. It was told to Jehoshaphat, a great multitude has come against you from beyond the Dead Sea, from Edom, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in En Gedi. I'll give you an idea. Not one nation, these are nations, okay? Not one nation actually came against King Jehoshaphat. Three. They all decided, these three nations they decided, wow, what a good day to wipe out Judah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, looking into the calendar. Yeah, today is the day we all just get together and wipe out Judah. Yeah, okay, all right. Just checking, just checking. So three nations gathered together and basically want to wipe them out. And what's worse is, when King Jehoshaphat heard the report, these guys have already assembled. You see, you must understand, when he received the message, it's not, okay, King Jehoshaphat, we are going to go there and we're going to, you know, open a big can of whoop. Okay? Right? <laughs> okay. Use your imagination. Okay? It's not a threat. It's these guys, when, when King Jehoshaphat received the message, they were already there. Okay? And just to give you an idea, Hazazon Tamar was only 15 miles away from Judah, which is less than a one, one day march. That means at any time, if they decided, okay, in the morning after breakfast, let's go. But by, by the time if evening came, they would be at your doorstep, literally, you know, destroying against three nations actually banded together, their whole collective might to wipe them out. So King Jehoshaphat was in a real big problem. So if you thought that you had a bad day, this guy had a real problem real bad day okay so what did he do okay now in most circumstances you probably do this right why have you reversed that okay okay so what king Jehoshaphat, king jehoshaphat did was the first aspect of worship is basically he asked god for help ask okay you have to ask god for help so in second chronicles chapter 3 it basically said this then king jehoshaphat feared and set himself determinedly as his vital need to seek the lord he proclaimed a fast in all of judah okay and then what's more not only he feared he called for a fast judah okay what happened is they said that when he proclaimed that fast, the whole of Judah gathered together to ask help from God. So they all had a collective prayer meeting, combined prayer meeting. Okay? And even out all of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord, yearning for Him with all their desire. Now, you've got you to picture this. This guy just ran a successful revival program in his kingdom. He did all these fantastic things for God. And the moment that almost ended, Three nations want to wipe him out. How do you think he feels? Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. You know, I don't know. Some people have this uh, funny feeling that, you know, if you serve God, God will place you in this impenetrable bubble, you know, that no sickness and no harm will come to you. You know, but if you read your Bible carefully, right, it actually doesn't say that. It says that God will actually, because He is God, he will actually give you the strength to give you boldness, to give you courage to actually to rise above it. Yeah, so 
God actually basically gave you the strength. He never said He's going to keep you safe. Yeah. So that's, that's something that we have always put out in mind because there was a time when I was you know, a young Christian, I always complained. I said, you know, God, I'm doing all this for you. I'm serving you. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, tithing and I'm giving an offering and what? I, I, I'm not getting that promotion. I'm not getting the, and I'm, my car broke down. Everything just seems to be going wrong. Why, God? Why? You know? It's as though you put your card in, you press your combination number, ATM, God, the ATM, give me money now. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way, eh? you know. God has His purpose and His plan, right? So, first thing, the first aspect about worship is asking God for help. Now, the funny thing about this thing is that asking God for help, eh, there are a few things that run through people's mind. Now, if you see, what I love about the Bible, eh, especially, is each of the role models and all the characters in the Bible, right, are real people, so they fear, they hunger. They get sad, they cry, they weep. You know, there's none of that. You know, they're what, oh, they're superhero, you know. Fear is for the weak. Oh, you know, Superman, you know, that kind of thing. No, none of that. These guys are real people. When, when King Jehoshaphat received the news, right, of such a down, such a horrible news, he feared. Okay? Now, as Christians, let me just put it, put it uh, uh, straightforward to you. There is nothing wrong with fear. Okay? Okay, there's nothing wrong with fear. Fear is just the false evidence of appearing real. That's all. Okay? So fear, there's nothing wrong with fear. The problem is how you respond to it. Okay? Now, King Jehoshaphat, if you take a look at what happened, he feared for the nation, right? He knew that these three nations, they're not going to go up you know, and come up to the kingdom on his doorstep you know, and just knock and be invited to have a cup of tea. They really wanted to just overtake the kingdom and overthrow the, the kingdom. So he knew that there's going to be loss of life, there's going to be tremendous loss of property. This is decimation. This is annihilation. This is on the brink of death. This is war. There's nothing good about it. There's, there will be no good outcome. It's almost bleak. And they are 15 miles away, camped outside, all three of them. Finish. This is it. This is it, folks. So King Jehoshaphat knew the situation. He was not going to delude himself. Now, so I don't know what kind of weird teaching that out, out there, but I have encountered people, right, who say that, you know, even though they have problems, they have sicknesses, or they have encountered problems, when you ask them, hey, how's your day, man? Everything's fine. Praise the Lord. Everything is great. Any problems? No, nope, no problems. Everything is fine. Okay, there's a difference uh, between denial. <laughs> okay, that's denial. Okay, denial means uh, if you keep on denying this kind of thing, right, it's, it's actually very, very bad, you know, because it's a psychological thing, you know. This is, this, if, if you are compulsive, uh, if you always have this kind of denial process uh, where, oh, nothing, 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 I choose to ignore the problem and it will go away, I'm assuring you, it won't, okay? So nothing in the Bible says that we should deny or we all should, you know, just say Poop, the, the problem, right? Don't acknowledge the problem. We just sweep it under the carpet or we just say, oh, no, God's going to handle it, so therefore we'll put it away. No. The Bible is very clear. When you face a counter, a problem, we know that there's a problem. We pinpoint it. We know what is the source about it. But the only difference is that instead of the fear, the fear motivating you to become paralyzed, to make you become a worry ward, to then suddenly just say, oh no, I don't have the resources to keep cope with this. This is just too overwhelming. I, I just got to quit. You know, that's the simplest thing. You, know? you see here, King Jehoshaphat was facing extinction for his people. But what? fear drove him was it actually motivated him to pray. It actually created a platform that says, you know what? Right now, you do not have the physical capacity or the resources to cope with this. Because if you're going to rely on yourself, quite frankly, this is gone. You're finished. There was absolutely no way out. That's why that fear right, basically drove him to actually seek to God and pray. And that's good. That's good. That's good fear. That's the kind of fear, right, that obviously if Evan decides to take his finger and stick it into an electrical plug, right, I'll just, I'll basically instill that fear into him, of course. You know, he's not going to get it from God, lah, you know, instinct, you know. You know, I will give, I will have to give a helping hand, lah, you know, to instilling that fear, right. But that's a good fear, you know, right. That's not a bad fear, that's a good fear. That will save his life in the same, same thing. So the first aspect that we have to see is that whenever there's trouble, 
we have to go and basically go to God and ask God. But the funny thing about this thing is that it's also a joke because as Christians, right, why is it that we always put God at the back burner? When something happens, we always try to solve it physically. When we know time and time again from the Bible, right, they always say, even before you start anything, you always have to ask God, okay, God, I need your divine wisdom. I need you to be here. I need to see this problem from your perspective. But what we do actually in reality is the complete opposite. Strange, isn't it? Okay? So the first aspect is basically to ask. The second aspect, the second aspect is to believe. We have to believe that God can handle your situation. Okay? Now, if you see in King Jehoshaphat's story, what did he do? So he's gathered all the people already. Okay, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5. All the people know this is not going to be a happy outcome. They know when the king has called them all for a combined prayer meeting, it is serious. Okay? So King Jehoshaphat is the leader. He stands up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the temple and before the new court. And then he basically said in a loud voice. And what he says in the next six verses is actually like a model prayer. A model prayer in time of calamity, how does he approach, how does he worship God? How does he even muster up that strength? It's actually contained in this following six verses. It says, He cries out, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, O God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. They dwelt in it. They have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if evil comes upon you and everything. But, you know, if you go up all the way to the uh, verse 12, it says, oh, our God, will you not exercise judgment for them, for we have not mine. But you see, the funny thing about it is, in the midst of a prayer meeting, right, you probably think that King Jehoshaphat, the first thing he will do is, okay, God, you know we're facing extinction, help us out here, right? But it's so strange, right, that the first thing he does, right, instead of asking the people, okay, what are all your prayer needs, okay, let's put it in the combined bucket, okay, so let's pray for your prayer needs now. What he does is actually he makes a declaration to God, right? Did you, God, what, are you not the Lord? First of all, it's, Everyone who reads this, you'll probably know that this is definitely symbolic. Because no way God has forgotten right, what He has done. Obviously, He's God. He knows. Obviously, He created the world. Right? You don't have to remind Him. He knows, right? But why is it that He's reminding Him? Actually, it's more of His own self. He's reminding myself of who God is. It's very important. When we come to God in the midst of your worries, before we worship God, when we go out on stage, especially for musicians or you're having a bad day at the pews and you're like, oh man, how can I even worship God? It's time to remind yourself. And why is this so important? Because we're human. Sometimes when we focus on something so much, we forget all the fundamentals. You know, I'm sure some of you guys in your own career or in some work, some of the things that you do requires problem solving, right? Sometimes it requires a novel approach to a particular thing. It seems like there's no, no, uh, uh, there's no solution. And that's because you're so focused, sometimes you're so focused on the problem, right, that you think that everything else is hopeless. That's why sometimes it's good to take a time off and, okay, let's take a step back. Okay, let's relook the whole thing. Fundamentals, what are the basics here? What is the problem? It's like a funny story, you know? Like, uh, I can relate. Like this Abigail, right? Um, <laughs> my wife. Sorry, I'm nervous. Okay, so what Abby does is that Evan, before he sleeps, right, every night, um, Abby makes it a point to actually go through a devotion with him. So, um, sometimes you probably have heard him saying, you know, so he will always end this prayer, right? In Jesus' name you pray, and go, Amen. Cutest Amen ever, okay? But I'm biased because he's my son. Okay? So one day, you know, uh, Abby tells me, you know, so he was, so they were doing that devotion and he about to tuck Evan to sleep. So in Jesus' name we pray, and then Evan pauses, and then with his cheeky smile, he looks up. iPad. What? iPad? No. In Jesus' name we pray. iPad. <laughs> okay, that's because the whole day, right, he's been focusing on his iPad. 
So obviously that was a clear signal to us that he has to go to a serious Apple rehab. Lah. Okay, but while he's going to rehab, that illustration, if a small child, if a small child basically, right, can unlearn some of the basic fundamentals that he was taught, right, and just focus on an iPad, just a simple thing like this, what more adults? Sometimes we are having such a bad day, it's so overwhelming, sometimes we have to remind ourselves, look, God, we have to remind ourselves for our sake, for our benefit of who God is. And then, you see what Joseph did? He started relating of what has God done. Because in the midst of all that confusion, right, he basically said, you know what, God, you are the God who created the universe. You are the God. And then he started recollecting. You know, God, you did this, you know. You delivered my people. So one thing that really helps, right, especially in your midst of your worry, to help you to actually overcome it and worship is to remind, you, remind yourself, hey, you know what, God, if it weren't for you to just help me out uh, last week, right, I would be, have been stranded in KL, man. You know, you start recollecting all the good things that God has done for you. So it shifts the focus away from your worries. Yes, the worries is still there, but you're just shifting the focus. You're taking a step back and say, hey, is, is it not God, the God who delivered me from all these problems, who have done all these exceeding amazing things, these this things that just seem to fall into place, can He not do it again? So it just tells you and just reinforces the fact that if God could do it, it's just pressing the replay button. How easy it is. So then the problem seems so small, you know, compared, compared to the bigness of our God, right? Okay, so now, we move on to the next thing, the third aspect for us, how do we worship in the midst of worry? Confess. Okay, see, confess my inadequacy. Okay? Now, confess my inadequacy talks about humility. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, King Jehoshaphat basically said, Our God, will you not exercise judgment on them? For we have no might to stand against this great company that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. This is the most, that's a very humble prayer. Example, sometimes right, as a leader, right, the expectation is that you know all the answers. But the truth of it is everyone acknowledges it, but for some strange reason, in reality, right, everybody expects the CEO, or everyone expects the supervisor, or everyone expects the leader to know it all. The reality is, they don't. They don't. They don't know it all. They're human beings. If they did, they wouldn't need employees. Right? They don't need your feedback. They don't need brainstorming sessions, right? Because the fact of the matter is, human beings don't know it all. But we expect that people who have been placed in power, right, or we put in a particular position, know it all. The fact of the matter is, they don't. In the same thing, let me just share a little bit about the worship from a worship ministry perspective why it's so important, especially uh, as worship leaders and as musicians, when we go up on stage and even as a congregation. It is not to say that just because when you're involved in worship in one way or the other, some of us basically have talents that we can use to create an environment where you can worship. Some enjoy the fruits of that environment. That means you worship from the crowd. And it's important. Without the crowd, we won't be encouraged to serve. Right? It's because of you guys that we are encouraged every day, without fail, we practice, we learn the songs, everything. It's because the congregation, you guys motivate us to want to do harder, to do better, to give a, create a platform and environment that you guys will love. In the same way, it's not the other way around. Where you think that, oh, uh, you know, you guys don't matter. Worship is only done by you, us musicians. No, it's actually a twofold thing. But because we are all in this worship experience together, Humility is the most important thing when it comes to worship because the problem with going up on stage is that when we approach the throne of grace, when we go and worship God, the Bible is very, very clear. Who can ascend his holy hill? But he, but a, no, um, how can a man ascend his holy hill? But he who has clean hands and a contrite heart. Contrite means a broken and a humble heart because we know that God, the one thing he hates is the proud. He resists the proud. He really dislikes it. He hates it. Hates is a very dis destructive word, right? In other words, if you go to God with a spirit of arrogance, you are not going to. You're not going to get anything. You know? 
Which is why sometimes, right, I fail to, I fail to understand why is it that some Christians or some of uh, musicians even, most of us, sometimes we, after a while when we've all been serving for some times, right, we have this idea, right, it's like, oh, you know, we play an integral part and if I don't feel like it, you know, that I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't serve. And then it, it, it starts, you start losing the fundamentals. Let me just put it in this context. When you're in your job, right, and in our careers, when you've been tasked something to do, sometimes it's not, sometimes when you have an important project, right, and everybody's counting on you, right, when you're ill, it's not uncommon for somebody who's ill who still comes back to the office and he's still doing it. And then you're like saying, hey, but you don't feel you're up to it. Oh, yeah, man, but a lot of people are counting on me. And then you go and do it. Sometimes when you wake up and you go to your work, I can tell you nine out of, well, nowadays, seven out of ten times, I'm beginning, sometimes there are times where I wake up and I'm a dread to go to work. I don't want to go to work, you know. Of course, and Abby reassures me, like, you know, she just kicks me out a bit. <laughs> right? But, oh, okay, right? Sometimes you don't feel it, but you still got to wake up. You got to change. You got to go out there because you've been tasked. Your purpose, you have a purpose now. You've been tasked. People are counting on you. you are res there's responsibility, right? Then why is it sometimes, right? It's, it, it amuses me. Sometimes Christians, we say the darnest things. Sometimes we're like, you know, I'm, I'm in a very bad place right now, you know. I, I'm really anxious. There's some problems. I don't feel, I, I'm not in the right frame to serve God. Wait, isn't the responsibility to worship God, whether you don't feel like it or don't feel like it, you have to worship God, right? It's not an option. It's not an option. See, for work, right? You can say, oh, oh, you know, I don't feel like getting out of work today, lah. I'm gonna call in. I'm sick. I'm sick. You know, you go fake call yourself a sicky kind of thing, and then get an MC, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God, but unfortunately, God knows, uh, God sees all. Okay, so you cannot just go. God, I'm sick. I'm sick. Yeah, yeah, I'm sick. Oh, PS4, PS4. Sick. No, I'm sick. I'm sick. Oh, FIFA, FIFA. You know, okay, you can't. Okay, God sees everything, so He knows. Do you? You're not worship leading, but you're at home playing FIFA. Really, on your PS4. Wow, great job. You know, so there's no sickies and everything, right? Okay, you can't do it because God sees it. So why is it that sometimes, right, we all feel the need to actually <laughs> invent this kind of stuff? It's because sometimes, right, we don't, we have a very false idea of what worship is, okay? So worship really, right, it comes back to this thing in John 15. In John 15, it basically says, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's true. In, and that word nothing is very, very interesting because in all versions of nothing, right, whether it's Aramaic, you know, whether it's Greek, okay, I know some of you are probably just going into the Hebrew or something, you know, trying to check that word. Okay, let me assure you right now, right, the word nothing means nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing, okay? So just to clear your doubts, in case lah, you are wondering, oh, but nothing means, you know, uh, we've got, I know God can handle, no, 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 it means nothing. Without God, you can handle nothing. Okay? Which is why Philippians 4.13 has so much meaning. Because apart from God, you can do nothing. With God, you can do everything. You can do anything. You can do all things. Right? So that's why, right, it's so important as musicians sometimes. We, when we go up on stage, it's not us playing guitar. Because sometimes, you know, right, during practice, how beautiful we sound. You know who you are, right? Okay? I know, I know, I know you guys, right? You have this idea that you think that if you don't listen to the songs and you don't practice, right, that you can magically go up there and then improvise. Yeah, I may not be God, but I'm listening. Okay? Okay? No. But then you know what's the amazing thing? At the end of it, we do our best, and then what do we do? We say, we acknowledge God, we do everything that's physically possible. You got to take over now. And you know what's the amazing thing? You guys actually pull through. It's the most amazing sound. Everyone's like, wow, I love the worship. It's so tight. And I'm like thinking to myself, how do, I, how do we even take this compliment? I just sat through the practice. It was awful. How can I even take this? And people are going up, shaking your head. You sang so well. I kind of amazing. You just hit it. And I'm like, what the heck? It's a God thing. Okay, God, yeah, okay. Okay, so 
it goes, and then after C, we go to D. That's why it's depending on God to save me. It's so important. Depending on God. We have asked, we believe, we confess in our inadequacy, and then now we depend on God to save, save me. Now this is a very, very simple but very hard rule. What did King Jehoshaphat do? King Jehoshaphat basically prayed, he sought the Lord, he reminded God of all the things that he has done, and that's it. That's it. He just waited on God's reply and he and waited for God to actually move. Right? So, and the funny thing is uh, about it is if you see, if you read the Bible, it just says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jahaziel, the son of Zechariah, and the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, and the son of Mataniah, a Levite. So he was a priest. It was not anyone, it was a priest. So we know that God actually wanted to give a message. So after he did all that prayer and everything, God answered. And he said, Hearken all Judah, you call all Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, Be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Wow, okay. So, But this is, this is the strangest thing. Tomorrow, go down to them, and behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the ravine before the wilderness of Jeruel, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your positions, stand still, and see the deliverance of the Lord. That's it. What? That's it? That's it? Um, aren't you going to like swoop down and zap it? No, no, no. Just take your positions, wait, and see the deliverance of the Lord. What is the deliverance? I don't know. God didn't say anything. He just said He's going to be delivered. Now, this is the funny thing. Sometimes uh, as Christians, right, do you notice that sometimes when we all go to God and we ask God, right, Lord, deliver me from this problem. Deliver, from, de- deliver me from this, this situation and everything. And then help comes. But it's not in the form that you expect. Right? Right? Okay, question. If you were in a position, in a position of such desperation, that you actually ask God for help because you didn't know how the help was going to come and in what form that help was going to come and in the manner of which that help was going to come and who was going to deliver that help, why is it that when the help actually comes, you then say, no God, um, you didn't give the help uh, in the way I wanted and it wasn't packaged the way I wanted and it wasn't delivered to the person the way I delivered. Strange, right? It's like that, that's that joke, you know, right? That, that some of you all probably know. Guy was on a guy was uh, in a house the, it was being flooded and then everyone was basically evacuating and then he said no when the rescuers came hey they knock on the door I think it's time for you to, to get out right because everywhere it's flooding no I'm not going to move until God tells me God will save me so I'm here I'm going to seek God God says he's going to help me he's going to send help okay so river right, flooding goes up to the, to the knee level Guys are pedaling, they're wading in. Hey, guys, dude, you, you got to go, man. But really, really, you got to go. Because we, we, it's almost inaccessible now. Nope, I'm still here. I'm waiting on God. I won't budge until God sends help. Okay, fine. River rises. He has no choice but he had to climb up on top of the roof. Okay? Guys are basically calling down, now will you, you know, on a, on a life raft, now will you come? You know, nope. I'm still going to worship God. Almost up to the roof, helicopter comes. Dude, this is the last chance. Okay, are you going to jump onto the helicopter? Look, I'm, I'm going to stay committed. I pray to God, God is going to save me. And until God saves me, I ain't going to move. So obviously he died. Lah. <laughs> Correct or not? Cause, you know, and of course he goes to heaven, it means ridiculous. You know, where were you, God, you know, when I wanted for help? Yeah, I sent the guys to knock on your door. I send you an early warning. I send a life raft. I send a helicopter. What more you want? Right. Correct or not? So some of the times, right, we Christians, right, we are so impractical. No? We, we ask God for help, right? We seek God for help. And then help comes. And then we Christians, right, have this strange kind of weirdness, you know. Suddenly, right, oh, we say statements like, oh, we can't accept that money. Lah. Because that money uh, is from a Buddhist center, right? that donation. Cannot, cannot, cannot. Not. This is non-Christian, right? non-Christian. Only God help uh, Christian source will come. Uh. What the? Okay. So if that's the case, uh, 
God, it's raining now. Please send help. A taxi. So uh, somebody, uh, a taxi or a uh, uh, passerby, a good Samaritan comes in. Then you see, oh, yo, got a picture of a Buddha there. Uh, no, la, no, la, you can go. La, you can go. It's okay, it's okay. I'll take the next one. Dude, really? Dude, okay, so it's very important. La. Let's not over-spiritualize things, okay? When God basically sends help, okay, God basically, you just have to learn to let go and let God. Okay? Don't go and try and try and fight God's battle for you. La. Sometimes as we Christians, uh, we always think that God uh, requires our helping hand, right? You know, you know what I mean? Okay? Any if any of y'all have gone for rescue training, right? For especially for life saving training, uh, for swimming, right? You always know that the first thing is when you see the victim that's struggling on the water, you have to try and calm the fella down first. Right? Why? Correct. No, no. If it's too frantic and then he will drown, that's okay because you're alive. The problem is when you are trying to save him and he's frantic, both of you will drown. Right? So what they normally do is there's only two options. One, wait until the guy tires out and then go and clasp him and then swim back. Or knock his lights out. Correct. You, okay? Because the problem is when you are the lifesaver and you want to go and save somebody, this guy thinks that he's helping, he's not. He's going to drown both of you all. So that's why there are times, right, if you are depending on God to save you, let go, let God. God is so much bigger. You acknowledge Him, right? You told, you reminded yourself how good, how good God is, how big God is. Now let Him do His job. It's important, okay? Now, let's go to E, which is very important. Express. Express our thanks to God in advance. Now, in advance is very important, huh? okay? In advance. Sometimes, you still don't feel like it. And sometimes, the solution or relief is on the way, but it's not happened yet. So you're still stuck with the problem. But guess what? You still thank God in advance. What did King Jehoshaphat do? He did the, the weirdest thing. So God tells him that, okay, you guys take positions, you do nothing, and see God's deliverance, right? So what does King Jehoshaphat do? He says, he consults with the people and then he appoints singers to sing to the Lord and praise Him in their holy priestly garments as they went out before the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for His mercy and loving kindness endures forever. So get this, this is the battle plan, right? Okay, so all his, he's meeting up with all his generals and says, okay, three nations, the collective might of three nations have encamped in this particular area. They're one and a half they are 15 miles away, one about one and a half, uh, one close about one day march to uh, Judah. So what do you want to do, O king? How do you want to bolster our defenses? I was thinking, let's have, let's have, uh, let's have a special team of choirs. Let's send out the choirs before the army. Okay, so what tactic is this? Sonic warfare, is it? Are you going to terrify the enemy with your out of key singing, you know? Everyone's like, while they're running out in panic, you know? That's when the, the army at the back will, you know, come in and rout. No, 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 no. That's a good one. That's a good one. You know? But seriously, right? What? Yeah, that's what he did. He sent out the musicians in front. Okay. Take note, nah. take note, musician, music team. Okay. 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 So in case you're all wondering, right? Music, the music team, right? The musicians are actually are very, very important in warfare. Okay, it's just, just a bit of trivia. Do you notice that last time in ancient warfare, you always notice, right? Why, uh, like all those, you know, the Confederates versus the one, you know, and then they, they always have this drummer boy and then the flute, they're always standing out in front. And then you are knowing, you are probably watching the movie and saying, no, you guys are going to be cannon fodder. You're right out in the thing, and all you've got is a flute, unless that flute's a blow dart, right? <laughs> You're dead, man. You're dead. Right? Because he's not carrying weapons. Because when he's playing that flute, he can't hold the musket, right? So it's like, why? And then the drummer guy is like, do, 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 and then the guy, you know, one silly guy holding the flag there. You know? And you're thinking, man, hit list, first ones to die. Mm -hmm. They're so dead. Okay? But the reason why they do it is actually musicians, right? If, if, just to let you know, they play a very, very important thing. They actually are morale boosters. Do you know that if they did not play the drums, uh, what, or they played that flute or anything, and the flag doesn't move, right? When you're commanding over 
more than 100, over 500, a battalion of soldiers, right, and they're all on foot, they won't be able to move. They won't know when to move or stop. So all to do is positioning. And when they march, they follow the beat of the drum. So they're not walking all over the place. So when you're actually moving, right, they follow the beat of the drum. So actually, we are not cannon fodder. We actually have an important thing. But because musicians are often in the front lines, that's why we also get the most hits. Okay. But, you know, front lines, front row seats, right? That's the most exciting, right? Okay. Right? So, it, what King Jehoshaphat basically said that, so funny, he sends out the choir. Okay. So everyone's like thinking, man, the, the king has probably lost it. Why are we even sending it out the choir? And you know what? In verse 22, the moment they came out in singing and everything, they were all marching and they were saying, wow, this is just the weirdest battle plans. When they actually hit the, hit the hill and actually oversaw the enemy encampment, they were expecting, you know, a three nations collecting might about to wipe them out and, uh, you know, the praise band is in front, you know, woohoo, tambourines and everything, right? They thought, finish lah, this one. You go there, it's all wiped out completely gone everything there was a great victory so it's very very important to thank God in advance to even worship God so let's move on to the next point so in this story in King John's fat in 2nd Chronicles chapter 20 verse 24 26 it says this when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness and they looked at the multitude and behold there were dead bodies fallen on the earth none had escaped this is the collective might uh, of three nations and none escaped. What happened? They just wiped themselves out. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat leading them to Jerusalem with joy. Okay? And look at this. It says there, they actually went in to go and plunder. So what happened was, King Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoils. So now, when we say spoils, uh, among them were cattle, the goods, the garments, precious things they took for themselves, they could carry. They, went, they took so much that it took them three days for them to actually empty out all the collective wealth that was all amassed there. And this is the interesting thing. On the fourth day, they assembled in that same valley, the Valley of Baraka, which they named, um, and then they blessed the Lord. So the funny thing is, Baraka actually means blessing. And this is the ironic thing. In the midst of annihilation, right, they sent out, they chose to worship instead of worry. God delivered them. And that same place that was supposed to wipe them out was named a blessing. In the same way, right, God can deliver us. He can turn your place of hardness, that, that trouble, that thing that's hopeless, and then when you look back at it, man, that was such a blessing, man. How did God just flip that thing around? Right? So that's the power of worship. That is the power of worship, you know. So really, if we all take one step back, uh, okay, if we all take a uh, step back. So in conclusion, as a closing, right, worship, yeah, the next slide, yes. Yes. Yes, brother. Thanks. Okay. So these six aspects of worship that we all have covered basically will enable you to basically worship in the midst of your worry. Okay, so even right now, as I invite the band to come up, right, I just want to say a short prayer, right? Okay. okay. Oh Lord and Heavenly Father, I thank you, O oh God, that you are a God of mercy. You are a God of deliverance. You are a God of promise. You are a God who basically can turn and give hope where there is hopelessness, O oh God. Lord, I thank you, O oh God, that in the midst of our worry and in the midst of our anxiety, O oh God, we are not going to deny it. We acknowledge there is a problem. We acknowledge, O oh God, that there may be some, some of us may be sick, some of us may not be feeling well, some of us may be encountering things that we are, are currently battling with at the office or with our clients or, or with our family. We have struggles because we are real people. But we know, O oh God, despite these troubles, we are going to acknowledge God. We are going to ask you for help, oh God. We're going to believe that you are mighty, that you are able to assist us in this, in this situation. We are going to know and confess that we are inadequate because we need you, oh Lord. We're going to depend on your promises because we know by us right now, we are going to claim that victory. We're going to express 
our thanksgiving through worship in advance because we know we can find hope and you can turn even our problems into a blessing. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand for Stefan. Hallelujah. That's so good, huh? the message ABCDF. You won't forget it for sure. And uh, how appropriate it is, huh? because we're going through uh, a battle. I don't know, like I said, we're going through a spiritual battle. And it's not just the church, but I believe every individual, one of you, you're going through your personal battles as well. And outline here, is a strategy strategy is so simple let's start praising god start worshiping god that's what we're going to do stefan's going hey, stefan this uh cheng fei is going to lead us in the song and we're going to take this time to allow god to come into our lives as we enter into worship amen that's our battle plan let's worship god let's magnify him let's just live focus on him not on our battle but focus on him and start praising him Hallelujah. Come on, are you ready for that? Are you going to see the victory? Victory is already ours and we're going to see the, how God's going to turn the bad situation, whatever you're going through, into good. Our God is a God of hope and that's what we're going to sing about. Amen.